Well, usually when I am uh, away for the college, it's from the college, it's for one of two reasons. Either I'm asking people generously to support your education or serving on one another uh, ministry boards doing kingdom work related to Christian higher education or global evangelism. And it's a huge privilege for me to serve on the board of the Lausanne Movement. That board is truly global. When we have virtual meetings, some of us are in today and others are in tomorrow or yesterday, depending on how you look at it. Scattered over every continent, uh, people in all different time zones, leaders from many different backgrounds. It's a privilege too because of the mission of the Lausanne Movement, which is the gospel for every person, disciple-making churches for every place, Christ-like leaders for every church and kingdom influence in every sphere of society. A few years ago, Bryn Gillette was given a commission to put those pillars of Lausanne into visual form through his artistry as a painter. Let me show you how he illustrated a church for every community. Gillette produced artwork, I think, of stunning beauty. The central image here is the tall and beautiful Bride of Christ, depicted against a night sky, illuminated with countless stars. It gives her a kind of planetary scale. Her skin is dark, appropriately, to represent the global church, which today has a majority of black and brown faces. In her hand, you see the bright light of the gospel and streaming from this long blue gown are people of every tribe, every tongue, and every nation. To see this beautiful bride is an opportunity to be captivated by a vision of what the people of God can and will become. Beauty is our destiny. We've been saying this all year. And we need this vision of the church because, frankly, the church we see is not so beautiful, not so fully global, not as genuinely diverse, not as truly unified, not so clearly illuminated by the gospel. And that should cause us to long for the day when the people of God will look as beautiful as our Savior does. This year, we've considered a number of aspects of beauty. We've seen that God is beautiful, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. We've seen how our beautiful God created a beautiful universe, including those men and women made in his image. We've seen how beautiful it can be when a man and a woman become one flesh. And we have seen and will see again that to redeem his broken yet beautiful people, God sent his son into the world, our beautiful savior. And now as we widen our perspective to witness the beauty of the community, the beautiful community, that's the title I'm using this morning. I'm borrowing it from a marvelous book by a Wheaton parent, Erwin Ince, bearing the same title, The Beautiful Community. As we witness this beautiful community, we see God's kingdom goal, not simply to redeem individual believers, although he does that, but more broadly to create a new humanity in Jesus Christ, what the New Testament simply calls the church. 50 days after Jesus ascended to heaven on the day of Pentecost, the Holy Spirit was poured out on the early church. And we had this in our scripture reading this morning that through the preaching of Peter, especially and the other apostles, thousands of people put their trust in Jesus right on the first day, the first day as it were of the church. And they were from every nation under heaven. The book of Acts lists all the places they were from, Parthians, Medes, Elamites, people from Mesopotamia and Judea and Cappadocia, which is in Turkey, Pontus and Asia, Egypt, Libya, visitors from Rome, Cretans and Arabians. It must have been amazing and amazingly beautiful to see these people from all places repent, believe, and be baptized, washed clean by the life-saving blood of Jesus Christ. And beautiful too in their spiritual unity. The book of Acts goes on to describe what kind of community they had, their commitment to the word of God and to fellowship and to the Lord's supper and to worship and prayer and to deeds of mercy and to giving generously to people in need. 
And as a result, I would say, not surprisingly, people in that city were coming to Christ every day. I wonder, though, have you ever seen a church that beautiful and as a result, that effective for ministry? We'll get to some of the problems that the first Christians faced in a few moments. But the Holy Spirit does bring a new splendor to the church of Jesus Christ. And we see it in all of these as aspects, beautiful generosity, beautiful diversity, people from various backgrounds coming together, beautiful witness, which explains why people were coming to Christ. They were deeply attracted to the kind of loving community that they could only find in the church. And God intended and still intends that new normal, this, this new normal of a multi-ethnic multitude bearing united witness to Jesus Christ to be our eternal normal. Each of us individually bears God's image, but as the church, we bear his image in the world together as a new worldwide humanity that has turned its eyes to Jesus, who is at the center of our worship and adoration and witness. Here's how the Dutch theologian Herman Bavink explains God's plan. The image of God is much too rich for it to be fully realized in a single human being, only humanity in its entirety. An or one organism under one head spread out over the entire earth, proclaiming the truth of God. Only this is the fully finished image, the most telling and striking likeness of God. And I think in a way, if that's true, it means that really all of the beauty we've considered so far this year culminates of all places in the church. In this beautiful community where we are meant to see God, God's image, embodied creation, the beauty of our savior, it's all brought together by the beautifying power of God, the Holy Spirit, that same spirit that we have invited in worship this morning to rest upon us. When the, when the world looks at the church, it is meant to witness there the living and supernatural beauty of God. So why are we so ugly? Everywhere we look, we can catch glimpses of our Savior's beauty revealed in the people he saved, but sometimes the church is as ugly as sin. We see this already in the early church. I think as you, you could maybe talk about this in a New Testament class and maybe come up with a different answer. But I think there are two main themes to the New Testament. The beauty of Jesus Christ in his atoning death and in his triumphant resurrection and glorious ascension to heaven. And in contrast, somewhat, all the ugly issues that there are in the Christian community because of our ungodliness. See it already, even in the early chapters of Acts, you get a beautiful picture of the church. That's in Acts chapter, chapter two. By the time you get to chapter six, you see clear signs of division. The majority Jewish Christians overlooking the minority Greek Christians in the daily distribution of food for needy widows and hungry orphans. And praise God, they were able to work that through. Our fathers and mothers in the faith, they, they shared leadership across ethnic lines. They restored spiritual harmony. But as you keep reading in the New Testament, there are racial and social dimensions to almost every church conflict. The reason Paul famously told the Galatians that in Christ there is neither Jew nor Greek, neither slave nor free, there is no male and female, is because those divisions, race, class, gender, were some of the biggest threats to the witness of the church, and you see it in almost every epistle in the New Testament. It's striking that some of the strongest warnings in the New Testament relate to actions and attitudes that divide the church. Yes, we're, we're warned about idolatry and various kinds of immorality, but also so strongly about discord, slander, backbiting, and a long list of other bad habits that destroy Christian fellowship. We also see that unity was our Savior's priority. On the night he was betrayed, as Jesus was 
lovingly interceding for his disciples, praying his blessing and his vision for the church over them. His, his main concern was for us to be as one with one another as the Father is with the Son. And yet I have to confess that as I read the New Testament and consider our own often painful experience of living in Christian community, sometimes I wonder if the Holy Spirit was really listening. Where is the beautiful church that our Savior promised and prayed for? And here is why this matters. Because the church is meant to embody the beauty of the gospel. How will the world ever see how beautiful Jesus is unless the community bearing his name also bears witness to his beauty? The world in part is meant to turn its eyes towards Jesus by looking at the church. This is God's plan and purpose. And we can't just go around saying all the time, I know the church looks like a mess sometimes, but, but Jesus never fails. That's not how evangelism is supposed to work, although in a way that's true. We are meant to make Jesus visible to the world as the embodiment of his life-giving grace. And I ask again, if we are not beautiful, how will our Savior be seen to be beautiful? When we tear one another down, bear false witness against our neighbors to prove our point, when we perpetuate stereotypes about people from other backgrounds, when we belittle the gifts of the opposite gender, when we exclude people from other social groups or social classes, we are no longer bearing witness to the beauty of the gospel in ways that the Holy Spirit wants to use to bring people to Christ. Today, it is simply a fact that many young adults, including many who grew up in Christian families, are turning away from Christ. And one main reason, not the only reason, but one main reason is because they have never really seen the kind of Christianity we read about in the book of Acts, because when you see that kind of Christianity, you want to turn to Christ. So what would it take for us as the evangelical church in the world to be the church that has the beauty to draw people to Jesus? Let me just mention very, very briefly four works of beautifying grace that the Holy Spirit wants to do in our Christian communities that the Holy Spirit wants to do right here at Wheaton College. And they're all things that our fathers and mothers in the faith put on display in the book of Acts. First, practice hospitality. We all prefer to spend most of our time with people who are more like us. The early church was challenged to welcome people who were not like them. It was unavoidable, not only in Jerusalem, but also in Antioch, throughout Asia Minor. Jews and Gentiles were worshiping together in the same congregations, as were people from many nations. And the way they connected in those days was by welcoming one another into their most precious spaces, into their homes. Practicing such hospitality, I believe, is especially incumbent in any context on people from the majority culture, whatever it is, because they are already the most at home already. So who in your own context are you making time for building a new relationship with welcoming into your personal space with the goal, not simply of making someone else feel welcome, but actually at home? I love the way Erwin Ince there's that name again, describes this in his book on beautiful community. In order to be be in beautiful community, he writes, we have to experience belonging, more expressly belonging is an individual's community experience of being at home as a co-owner and co-creator of that community. It includes an individual's sense of being rightly placed in a specific community and feeling welcomed, valued, comfortable, safe, end quote. It is sad when members of our own community, because of their background or treatment or mistreatment, feel not welcomed, valued, comfortable, not as a co-owner or creator. And so we are called to practice 
hospitality. And second, to give generously. Hospitality is one form of generosity. We give of our time, our space, ourselves to care for a guest. But the first Christians in Jerusalem and other places did more than simply open their homes. They also opened their wallets. They saw a need, they met it. It was common in those days for people simply to sell their property and possessions so that they would have more money to give to the poor and to support their church and to provide for missionaries. Giving not simply from their excess, but from their substance. They were able to do it because the Holy Spirit, we read this in Acts 2, 46, had given them generous hearts. Do you know the Holy Spirit wants to make your heart beautiful in the same way? In a world broken by sin, we have so many opportunities to give. Housing refugees, supporting adoption, caring for the incarcerated, feeding the homeless, training the jobless, advancing the worldwide proclamation of the gospel through missions and evangelism. Get in the habit in college of giving even in small ways, and I, I think I can promise you'll enjoy it so much, you'll be looking for ways to give more. In God's economy, there is always spiritual abundance for those who give and then give again. Third, do justice. Our righteous God calls us to be righteous too, and, and that includes doing right by our brothers and sisters in Christ. I've already mentioned a notable example of this. In the first church in Jerusalem, minority Greeks were getting overlooked in the daily distribution of food, and so ironically, it meant that the church was being unjust in the way it was showing mercy. God help us, that's what it's like in a fallen world. When Greek believers came forward to voice their concern, something remarkable happened, and that is that leaders from the majority community listened. Rather than dismissing the concern, trying to defend themselves by saying they, they didn't mean to discriminate in that way, they, they humbly admitted there's a problem here, and they came up with a practical solution in conversation. They put Greek leading, Greek speaking leaders in charge. It's a very simple model, I think, for doing justice. It often starts with truly listening, not minimizing what people are saying, but believing what you hear and then addressing it in a God honoring way. If I can mention a specific here, our own Sofia Hernandez gave us an opportunity to do that just a few weeks ago as a community when she wrote a column in the Wheaton Record about what it looks like to take time to listen, in this case, to the concerns of Latino and Latina students. When we defer to one another, we have an opportunity to imitate God's triune love in which each person of the Trinity honors the others, and then we can see the beauty in one another and it leads to more respect, stronger partnerships, better solutions. Fourth, pursue reconciliation. Practice hospitality, give generously, do justice, pursue reconciliation. For the Christian community to be restored, we have to move towards one another. And this is part of God's redemptive purpose for us in Jesus Christ, breaking down walls of hostility, reconciling us to one another, making us truly one. At the end of last summer, I reached out to our faculty and asked them for examples of beauty from their own experience and academic disciplines. Professor Junie Park, who teaches film and communications, showed me this striking example of reconciliation. He had visited Rwanda and he had photographed Narcisse and Everiste. I hope you'll see their images here in a moment. Two neighbors who during the tribal conflict between the Hutus and Tutsis, one of them was part of a mob that clubbed the other's mother to death. And he assumed when the war was over that his enemy would seek revenge, and yet as much as he feared for his life, he, he also knew it was right to confess his sins. So Everest went to Narcisse and asked for forgiveness. It was a costly request. 
And it didn't happen right away. There's a, a story to it. But eventually the Holy Spirit healed their relationship. I think you can see it in this beautiful photograph. Can you tell who the victim is and who is the perpetrator? No, I think they have become beautiful brothers. Whenever the New Testament highlights our diversity in the church and wrestles with our painful divisions, it always works from the bedrock assumption that the Holy Spirit wants to unify us in Jesus Christ. And I, I like the way Erwin Ince expresses this. He says only Jesus is able to bear the weight of the center. In the New Testament, our unity in Christ is not an aspiration, although it is that, but it is more so a presupposition that by his reconciling work, Jesus has made us one in his spirit. And that gives us the assurance, I believe, that one day the church will look as beautiful as her savior does. God wants his son to be seen to be beautiful and for that reason has a plan for us to be seen to be beautiful. I love the promise that God made through the prophet Isaiah. He swore to his people, I will beautify my beautiful house, fulfilled in the first instance at the temple in Jerusalem, fulfilled again in the church, which the Bible says is the temple of the living God. Today we face a strong temptation to give up on the church. Many feel the temptation to watch from home, to sit in the back, to sleep in, to stop going, ever feel that way. For some of us, the church has become the scene of an ugly crime, and that makes it hard too. Nevertheless, God has promised that he will beautify his beautiful bride. And Jesus died on the cross. We'll be looking at this together next month, specifically because he loved the church and wanted her to appear in splendor without spot or wrinkle or any such thing that she might be holy and without blemish, like a bride on her wedding day. There's nothing more beautiful than a bride on her wedding day. As a minister, that's one of my privileges. I've been at the front of the church more than a hundred times to see the teary-eyed groom reach out a hand to the ravishing bride, more beautiful that day than any other. I see that. I'm catching a glimpse of eternal love, of infinite beauty. And it reminds me not to give up on the church, which certainly will one day be as beautiful as the glory of God. The night before my oldest daughter's wedding, she and her bridesmaids were at a neighbor's house out of town to be together overnight and then to make the next morning all the preparations. That house was an absolute disaster the next morning. <laughs> Stuff thrown, strewn all over the place. But apparently it was a mess worth making because out of those preparations, there was the beautiful bride. I looked at my daughter, I said, I'm, I'm seeing a glimpse of eternal beauty. This is a picture of what God wants his church to be. And our calling, Wheaton College, is not simply to wait for that day, but actually to live into it so that our world can see how beautiful our Savior is. Let's pray as the chapel band comes forward. It's good to be in Edmond Chapel together again, Lord after spring break. Lord, we believe you have a beautiful work to do in us and in your church. And we invoke the presence of the Holy Spirit to enable us to be something worth looking at so that the world may turn its eyes to Jesus. It's in his name we pray. Amen. We'll close with this song. Please stand to sing.